Before I get started in the lesson, I want to tell you that I need a new typist. This is my third sermon this week I prepared. I prepared one and Gloria says, I've heard that sermon before. I said, well, I, I preached it at Cherry Sink in March of 2018. She says, well, I know, and everybody else will too. So I prepared another sermon, got it all done, and she says, I don't like that sermon. <laughs> okay. So this is my third sermon, and uh, here we are. I want to thank Michael for the prayer. Thank you for remembering me to God. I appreciate that very much. The title of this morning's lesson is Hellfire and Damnation. That's the subject we're going to talk about this morning. Maybe at one time it was overused and maybe now it's not used enough. But we need to talk about not only heaven, but the consequences of not being able to go to heaven. In Genesis, the sixth chapter, we'll read verses five through seven. The writer says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. What a terrific, terrible statement that is. I mean, that will bring you to realize that God is watching us and I've often said throughout my adulthood that people such as this congregation and other congregations around are the only things that keep this world in its place. Because one day, God's going to be fed up with society, with, with people. And he's going to react just like he did then. Now, Noah, of course, found grace in God's eyes, and he was saved in his family. But other than that, he destroyed everything, and it will happen again. There was a poem that was written in the early 1300s. I don't know if you read it or not. It was by Dante, who was a, an accomplished poet at the time. And he wrote a poem called The Inferno. And in this poem, he explores the nature of sin by traveling through hell, and where evil receives the punishment in different levels according to God's justice. Now, this is just a man's idea of what hell's like. This is not biblical. It's his idea. But we all have these thoughts in our minds, and I'm sure you have too, about what hell is going to be like. And this is his thoughts. And it stuck with me. It was so dramatic in his writings that I have never forgotten it. it. It's just been one of those things that I can't get out of my mind. But his idea was that there was different levels of sin and there was different levels of punishment. But at a certain point, the punishment was that you had to run through fire and you never got to stop. You would get to the point where you say, I can't go on, I can't run anymore, I want to stop. And, but you can't stop because God doesn't let you stop. And you just keep running and you keep running and, and you're just burning and you have this sensation of burning up all the time, but you never burn up. And you wish that you could die. You wish that you could just disappear, but you can't. That's Dante's idea of hell. But what does the Bible say about hell? How does the Bible describe it? In Luke, the 16th chapter, we read a story. <clears throat> we read a story of two men. Two men that lived and two men who died. And their opposite lives were here on this earth and their opposite lives were in the hereafter too. 
Luke 16. Let's, I know that we all know this, uh, this story, but I think sometimes it's good for us to refresh our memory of the details. And besides, I think that a lot of people don't read the Bible enough, so this is another opportunity for you to read or hear the Bible. Luke 16, verse 19. The rich man and Lazarus. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared subtly every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at the gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died and also died and he was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them. At least they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one is raised from the dead. Story of two men. One was really well off in this life. The other was a beggar. The other was tormented while he was here on this earth. But in the hereafter, they were reversed in their, in their dealings. They were reversed in that the rich man suffered. He was tormented. Again, you'd think about just dip his finger and put it on my tongue to cool it a little. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Torment forever and ever. Now, Jesus tells us on the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew, the 6th chapter, and verse 20, where are our treasures to be laid up? Not here on this earth. It doesn't matter how much wealth you have here. It doesn't matter what you've gathered up. It will be of no consequence in the hereafter. As often stated, there are no Wells Fargo trucks behind the hearse. You can't take it with you. It's of no consequence for you. But if we lay up our treasures in heaven, then our treasures will be given to us and we will be rewarded. Hell is eternal. Well, what does that mean, eternal? It means forever and ever. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, in verse 46, it says, these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So it's going to be of equal length. There's no length. It's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We measure everything in time. Everything we know has a beginning and an ending. In our finite minds, we cannot understand that there is no time in heaven or hell. It's an eternity. And I've heard people argue the, the point that, that if I just go and sin for a little while here on this earth, and then I mature and I grow out of it, and I'm not doing that anymore, why would I be punished for an eternity 
forever and ever. Well, that's the way it is. That's what God tells us. But wouldn't it be fair if we go to heaven for it to be an eternity also? You don't want to be rewarded for just a short period of time and then heaven goes away. No, it's for an eternity. All the time, forever and ever. But it's hard for us to understand that and I realize that it's hard for me because everything I know has a beginning and an ending except for God and heaven and hell. Other than that, it's hard for us to comprehend. Eternity cannot be measured in time. Time will end, but eternity will not. If, if it was, perhaps we could tolerate hell if it was just for, say, a week or a month or a year or 10 years. Perhaps we could tolerate it if there was an ending to it, but there's no end. It just keeps going on. There's no such thing as time in heaven or in hell. Hell is also a place of darkness. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, in verse 30, it says to cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you remove God, you remove light, because God is light. And if, that's what's happened in our society. It's happened in our school system. When we remove God, we remove the light in all this darkness. <clears throat> darkness can be terrifying. We have been lost in darkness, and if you have never been lost in the darkness, then you've been blessed. But I have, and it's a terrifying event. Complete darkness, when you can't see the hand in front of your face, when you don't know any landmarks to find out where you're at, it's a terrifying thing to be lost in darkness. And in hell, there is no light. But, preacher, you just said that there was a, a fire. Well, maybe it didn't have a flame. Have you ever seen a chemical fire? It burns and burns and burns so, so hot. But there's no flame. And perhaps that's the way it is. So, I don't know. But hell is a place of fire and pain. In uh, Revelation, the 20th chapter... I'll read verses 15 through 20. No, 10 through 15. Revelation 20, verses 10 through 15. <clears throat> the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night forever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was set on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the book was open. And another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, and each one according to his work. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That ought to be something that we need to think about from time to time. And fire may be used metaphorically. Maybe there is a fire. Maybe it's just uh, this tremendous burning. I'm not sure. But it's complete darkness and complete pain and suffering. And weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says, I am tormented in this, in this flame. Torment equals severe pain, anguish. Pain so severe, 
so severe that one thinks they cannot endure it for another minute. Please let me die. Please let me die. But death will not come. Death will not come. Remember the rich man. Just a drop of water. But none came. In Revelation, the 14th chapter and verse 11 says, And the smoke of his torment ascends forever and have no rest day or night. You see, in hell, there's no easy life like we live today. There's no unions to protect our work week. We cannot work a 40-hour week. There are no vacations. There's no coffee breaks. There's no time off. There's no anything except for punishment, pain, and anguish, and torment. You can't work in shifts. He said, you take, you take an eight-hour shift, and then I'll do an eight-hour shift, or 10 or 12, whatever it may be. No, it's continuously all the time. The warning from the Apostle Paul to Timothy <coughs> in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Second Timothy chapter 3, I'll read the first seven verses. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, brutal, despisers of, God, of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captive of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various love, lust, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Perilous times and perilous men will come and try to create an apostasy. Things will happen to try to get the saved to fall away. That's what apostasy is. It's not that you don't know. You know the truth. And if you fall away, that's apostasy. And perilous times and perilous people will come to try to create that. But you have to be strong to the end. I have to be strong to the end. We cannot let the bumps of the roads of life deter us from staying strong, to staying in the good graces of God. The last days are all the days from the beginning of the church to the end of the church, to the second coming of Christ. We live in the last days, that's right. But I don't know whether the last days will come tomorrow or another 2,000 years from now. The last days is from the crucifixion of Christ and the establishment of the church till Christ Jesus our Lord comes the second time. That's the last days. So whether it's immediate or not, I don't know. But I do know this, that I won't live forever irregardless that there's going to come a day when I pass away. And I have to be prepared. I have to be strong. I have to fight until the end of time. Revelations is a very interesting book. A lot of times we tend to skip over it because we don't understand all of the uh, symbolisms that's used in it. And, and I don't claim to know this, all the symbolism that's in it. But I do know this, that God put revelations in this book for our learning and for our understanding. And there are warnings in this book. And we need to pay attention to them. The warnings come in chapters 8 and 9 from the seven angels who stood before God. When the trumpets of the Lord shall, time, shall sound and time should be no more. Think about that. The trumpets of the Lord in chapter 8 
verses, starting with verse 6. <clears throat> so the seven angels who had seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hell and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star was Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the waters because it was bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 in the inhabitants, inhabitants of the earth. Because of the remaining blasts of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. There would be three more to come. Continuing in chapter 9. Then the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star falling from the heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the boundless pit. Bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the, as the scorpions of the earth had power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth nor any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death, but they will not find it. And they will desire to die, and death will flee from them. As I drop down to verse 12. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen were 200 million. Some of your in, uh, translations may say 10 times 10 million twice, which comes out to 200 million. Now I heard the number, 200 million. I heard the number of them. At the time of this writing, there wasn't 200 million people on the earth. Now, you want to guess which army in this world has 200 million soldiers in it? You're right. It's China. China has 200 million soldiers. Isn't that a, kind of a coincidence? I think not. I think it was a revelation to us. 200 million. I heard that number, John says. Dropping down to verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts. 
so they still con stood condemned to die. Chapter 20, verse 15 of Revelation. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now all that may sound like doom and gloom, but it doesn't have to be. There is a bright side. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to experience that. And I do not either. There's also a place called heaven. And if we abide by God's word, God's law, we can achieve the glory of heaven. Let's read for a little bit in Revelation 22nd chapter, starting with verse 12. Jesus says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city, but outward are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices the law. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit of the bride says, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who think, who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And that's our salvation. That's our ticket to heaven. That's how we get there and avoid all of the tragedies of hell. If there's one here today that needs to obey the word of God, we would ask that you come forward while together we stand and sing.